Well, hello, friends. Welcome one and welcome all. I can't offer much in this outdoor hall, but sit here and rest. You must be weary, and I'll share with you Tales of Tyria. <laughs> This week on Tales of Tyria, we've got a mishmash of different things. We've got a few updates. We've got another rendition of Build Wars 2, focusing on the PvE perspective this week. And a Bridger rant. Are we still talking about the Trinity? Welcome one, welcome all, welcome to another exciting episode of Tales of Tyria right here on the Sound Strategy Network. www.talesoftyria.com is where you can find us. We record every weekend on Sunday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Actually, it's Eastern Daylight Time now, which only matters for those of you in Europe who don't switch until later on in the month. You crazy, crazy Europeans, you. Uh, actually, for all I know, it's a better system. I have not studied Daylight Savings Time. For all I know, Benjamin Franklin was an idiot. All right. Moving on, I am Bridger, the host of the show. We're talking about Guild Wars 2 here today, and I'd like to introduce my co-hosts. Joining me to my, um, bottom, we have <laughs> Vanka. <laughs> Welcome to the show, sir. Hello. Good afternoon. How you been? I'm good. It is gorgeous outside. It is, isn't it? It's finally spring. I just went to the dog park and came back, and I'm doing the show now. It's a good, good day. All right. Also joining us uh, for the first time in a long time, actually, we've got uh, Gigawatt, if I can find the right one here. Hello, sir. What's up, guys? So, uh, long time no see. You finally got your, 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 your uh, what you, uh, webcam. Wow, okay. Yeah, doing this the, early the in the day, clearly. <laughs> the non-cell just phone. Using, <laughs> yeah, just using the one in my... Built into my laptop right now. I couldn't find my good one, but all right. It's all right and that, I think. that other sinewy voice we heard over here. Sinewy. That's not a good. Uh, that's not it. What? What's a uh, uh, robust baritone? That's what I was looking for. <laughs> <laughs> it's freelancer. Welcome, sir. How's it going, Bridger? Not bad. Not bad. All right. So we are here today at an earlier time at the behest of the uh, the European listeners who always say, "Well, I would watch live." But it's 3 a.m. where I am when you go on, so uh, we're trying to do these every once in a while to give the both the, the both the night workers and the Europeans uh, a chance to get on the show. And unfortunately, if you work during the four-hour period where we sometimes have the show here on Sundays, there's nothing more I can do for you, and that's why we record it for you. All right, so let's talk about Guild Wars 2 here today. Uh, there's a couple of different things going on here. Uh, there was an interview with John Peters about uh, PvP stuff. There wasn't a whole lot of new stuff in there, but they did mention, and I guess we probably already knew this, but I, didn't, I don't remember the name of it. They called the resource that you earn in PvP, and I believe this would be structured PvP, is called Glory, which is pretty <laughs> awesome, I have to say. <laughs> if, if, I mean, can you guys come up concur. with a better name? I mean, you got influence for your guild, you got your karma for your personal character, and you've got glory for PvP. I mean, that's just an awesome name for different resources that you can have here. It's pretty Indeed. good. So, not that that's very super interesting. Um, like again, it's a light light week for light week for news. <laughs> uh, but you know, you can get your special PvP weapons, armors, and skins uh, by by getting this glory points and then spending them. Uh, so that should be easy enough. Just thought I'd mention it. Now, this is pretty interesting. Did you guys see the Total Biscuit Underwater video that was released this week? Mm -hmm. I did. Yeah. yeah. What do you guys think? This is, they they declare this is one of the mini dungeons. Uh, I was actually I was glad to see Total Biscuit so critical about the uh, underwater. I mean, you saw how many times he was complaining about it. Yeah. He was, and I'm hoping that Arena Net like takes half of that to heart. You know, he was complaining about uh, just the the lack of animation. Like it felt like you were just kind of stabbing air sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, he was talking about all sorts of different things. I enjoyed it. It was pretty good. I like I like the concept of the mini dungeons though. Very much, yeah. Especially it's activated by a mid event. 
That is freaking awesome. Yeah, I mean, they. I remember they talked about during the press beta, there was sort of a mini dungeon that was like, the only way you could get through it is if you push this one set of events to a certain point, then a portal would open and you could go to this like other plane of existence. And I remember one of the press nice. was t- telling a story of this and how they got into that other, you know, mini dungeon and was killed there and went back to the real world. And in that time, the NPCs had retaken the portal, so he couldn't get back to join everybody else. That's that's <laughs> oh, no. just really cool. I like that the world changes so much on a, on that time scale. Yeah, even this even the simple mechanic of just the little jumping puzzles in some of the mini dungeons. They were saying, I don't know. It's just that that little bit makes so much of a difference than just running around and killing, you know, mobs. Absolutely, and it's actually, cool. freelancer, you're talking about how. Um, Total Biscuit was critical. I mean, that's, I think, one of the reasons that I like him, and probably one of the reasons a lot of people like him, is that he will actually call out things that need calling out. You, you see so many, you know, traditional members of the press, when they when they write a preview or do a preview, it's always with the most high, optimal, like, if they do everything they say they will do, this game is going to be awesome. But yeah, did you <laughs> see the, like the tweet that he made where uh, it was in reference to Minecraft not having PvP and the backlash of Minecraft players everywhere? Really? <laughs> wow. It, it was awesome. And then his following tweets beyond that, I mean, he just said it outright. I, he's like, you cannot call Minecraft... Uh, you cannot say Minecraft has PvP, and he had like half a million people just rage <laughs> <laughs> hardcore. And for somebody to know, because in his position, you know, he's looking for that, those followers and stuff. And at the same time, that's where most people succumb to, you know, where they won't say things like that, you know, so they don't anger the the mass amount of people. He didn't care. He just said it outright, and uh, it was great. I, I got a lot of respect for him after that. So he doesn't he doesn't care about being politically yeah. correct in the gaming world, I guess. Yeah, that's kind of like why I like DJ Wheat so much as well. Like, if you watch his uh, One More Game series or his uh, when he hops on State of the Game and stuff, he doesn't really care about you, the fan, whether you agree with him or not, or whether you're going to get along with him. If he says this, he's just going to say it how it is. Uh, and I have a lot of respect for casters and all sorts of uh, esports figures that do that because, unfortunately, we we fall into this popular press idea where we we have to be careful what we say, and I I don't believe in that one bit. Well, I don't think it's you need to be careful of what you say. It's just that you don't want to say it in a condescending way unless you're DJ. I mean, not that he says it in a condescending way, but a lot of people will take it in a condescending way because they don't agree with it, right? But for those people, I guess, there's there's nothing you're going to say that will reason with them unless you're agreeing with them personally. So I guess his his sort of thoughts are, if there's no way that I can please them without changing, you know, what I say just to suit what they think, I might as well just say what I think. I, 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 I can get behind that, definitely. Yeah. I try to, pre- but, you know, as the host... And we are honest here on this show. That's we right. tell it how it is. <laughs> as the host, I have to always try to see both sides of an issue, because if everybody on the panel agrees... <laughs> It's not it doesn't make for a very good show, so I always try to play devil's advocate. I, I always quite enjoy the feedback we get, Bridger, where I make a strong stance about something I, I'm heartfelt about in PvP, and we get that email that's just like, Freelancer's so wrong, and then you get the email that's like, oh man, I'm right with Freelancer. And I'm, it, I, I, don't, I don't care. I, I am just fully spirited in, in what I feel is competitive, not competitive, and some people are going to agree, some people aren't. But you can't expect everybody to agree. You don't get anywhere with everyone agreeing. So. I will disagree with you. I'd rage on you. <laughs> <laughs> this is what we call in marketing a, a feedback character. He generates feedback just by opening how, his mouth. <laughs> how, boring would it, how boring would this show be if I agreed with Bridger 24-7? I mean, oh, that's why on. I brought him on. <laughs> this is, he's the John C. Dvorak of our show. Or, uh, you know, for those of you that watch the Twit Network. Anyway, we're getting a little off topic. Let's uh, jump back over here. Uh, I, there was actually um, some very interesting uh, comments. Of, you know, basically Eric Flanham talked about uh, TV's video uh, and talking about how the, the underwater area, despite looking like a traditional instance dungeon, was actually sort of an in-the-real-world thing that, like Vega said, was only accessible uh, when certain events aligned to allow you access to the area. And apparently that's how a lot of these, they call them mini-dungeons. They're, they're quote-unquote 
quote-unquote dungeons. They have sort of their own little thing that you go through step by step, and they have their own little sets of bosses, but it's not designed to be as challenging as a traditional instance dungeon, and it's just sort of to reward explorers and exploration, which I really love, because I love exploring and, like, seeing a brand new world and stuff. That's one of the reasons that got me back into Cataclysm. If Cataclysm hadn't been what it was, which was, check out how this world has changed, the one that you remember... I wouldn't have bought it, period, because I didn't buy I, I didn't buy, buy the uh, Wrath of the Lich King because there was nothing in there that really appealed to me. But Cataclysm, I was like, I want to see that volcano in Ashen Vale. You know, that just, yeah. I love that. See, so I was, even just, I, I, go ahead. Oh, even just watching the underwater video, obviously, I think it needs, I think it's pretty challenging. I think, I like how they wanted to include the underwater battle and the underwater areas as opposed to other games that try and avoid it because it is difficult to make underwater battle seem good and seem like it flows nicely and yeah it definitely needs some work but i think like right now they're doing a pretty good job with it in terms of the way it looks for i mean you know granted this isn't a game isn't even released yet but um yeah that's all i just wanted it's true <laughs> i was gonna say i was the opposite um like wrath of the lich king is where they finished off the Warcraft 3 storyline. So for me, I wanted to relive ah, that yes. moment. You know, This is a storyline that they had been working on for years and years and years. Um, you know, Whereas Cataclysm was much like the pandas coming out soon. <laughs> uh, it, it's just one of those things, like from Cataclysm on, it was just like they didn't put a lot of thought, they didn't put a lot of heart into the story um, like, they, like they did in Wrath. So for me, it was the complete opposite. I didn't jump into Cataclysm, you know, with excitement like I did Wrath because I wanted to play through, you know, that whole series with uh, with Arthas. And so it was just, uh, I don't know, that's just the way I was. I was the opposite in that case. Actually, I was let down by Cataclysm, I should say. So I was excited about sort of seeing how they had changed, you know, the, the world of Azeroth that I knew. But I was definitely let down by it. And I could definitely see how... Wrath of the Lich King being the culmination of that story of Arthas is just is would be really cool to to see. But I I never even really got into the the world of Warcraft raiding thing, and I, so I didn't know any of the story. If I had been, I definitely would be right there with you, because uh, I really did like the Warcraft Three story. I that was really amazing. Yep. That's one of the things that old Blizzard, and I don't know if maybe current Blizzard is still good. We'll have to see about <laughs> Diablo Three. But old Blizzard, <laughs> Diablo Two, and Warcraft Three has just amazing narratives. Just yeah. amazing. Well, that would be your Blizzard North company, and they also did the Diablo uh, storyline. They did uh, a lot of great games. I mean, the the ones we all truly remember. I mean, the the progress of Jim Rayner to the Zerg and everything in StarCraft from mm -hmm. Warcraft. You know, the the introduction of the Night Elves and all of that was a a group of people. And now they that group has since dissolved. We all know that story. Not no reason to go over that again. And they have this new group that is. It's appealing to mass media, and I could go on a rant about this, but come <laughs> on. Pandas and, and stuff like that, and they're taking all the ideas from other games. There's no more innovation there, and that's just my thoughts on it. And I'm sure a lot of people disagree, but that's the that's the way WoW's been going, and I think a lot of people see that, especially uh, hardcore gamers. They, they truly can see that. They can see that Blizzard, in terms of Diablo 3, I mean... We can go on a whole other thing about that as well. I mean, the, they just the don't have that. Yeah. yeah, they just don't have the spirit in their game. Like, if everybody remembers that first day they opened Warcraft three, you know, or that first day they opened Diablo two and they played through it, that is, those are days we will never forget. I, I just mm -hmm. have a feeling that we will open Diablo three because we're gonna play it. Let's be honest, you know, <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna play it. And I don't think we're gonna get that sense of like wow, like like we did with opening up Frozen Throne, you know, with Warcraft three. That's just that's what I, I that's what I see. It. I disagree, but I don't want to. I, as much as I love Blizzard and Diablo three, I, I don't want to. This is Guild Wars two. We are talking about Guild Wars two. Yeah, I will. <laughs> let's but proceed in, with in, cautious in a, optimism and leave it at that. <laughs> in, a, in a side note, I got a, a friend invite to uh, to the to beta. Swotor. Did you get to the beta? No, oh no, just to Swotor, <laughs> and um, I fell asleep in five minutes while I was playing it. Really? So I'm I I don't think that it is going to hold the light up to Guild Wars two. All right. I just yeah. I, I don't even think it's going to be on the same level. I've seen plenty of people talk about how Guild the the existence of Guild Wars two and knowing about what it's done and what it's going to do uh, is ruining all other MMOs for them. It's ruining I really, all other I really games. think it is because it's like 
you, you know what they're doing, and I'm so excited for it. And then when I play something that's an old style, it's just... It, it, the old styles already feel old, and Guild Wars 2 is even out yet. It's like you didn't know about those cracks that were there until somebody pointed them out and go, look at all the cracks in this facade. Do you really want to go into that temple? I got a better temple right over here for you. All right. Yeah. Anyway, getting back on topic, the Collector's Edition and a new Guild Wars 2 website have been confirmed. Not really news. I mean, everybody knew there was going to be a Collector's Edition, but there was a cool little extended experience interview uh, with, I believe, Pixelglass.com was on there, uh, in which they talked with uh, Kate Welch, 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 uh, from, from the Guild Wars 2 uh, extended experience team, specifically, I believe, the, the web development team, essentially. And uh, so that that's a pretty cool little interview. I just recommend did they Did out. they go over what's in the No, they, they just, she just sort of offhand mentioned, oh, you know, my team works on, you know, the graphics and design for things like the boxes for the standard and collector's edition, dot, 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 and then went on to other things. And then mentioned how they're revamping GuildWars2.com to having things, you know, being prepared to have things like the World of Warcraft Armory, for example, and other things that you'd expect on an MMO website. So, yeah, we're getting that eventually. Freelancer's smirking over there. What are you thinking? Uh, we got somebody in the chat. You know, I, I'm looking over because I like to react to some of the... the, the more intelligent comments, but I can't help but notice when somebody says, doesn't it feel like Giga is watching your soul and st <laughs> <laughs> staring staring straight at you? That's why you gotta put your camera a little bit to the side so you can have an angle and just get a... I, I love our audience. That, that just made my day right there. <laughs> Give me back my soul. Alright, so let's move on here. I believe uh, last I I was week... not supposed to look at the camera. Nope, nope, look down at the... So last week we had a, a discussion about, you know, players who don't know how to dodge should just have all their buttons replaced by dodge buttons. And with a little, <laughs> a little quick uh, help from Photoshop, Freelancer made this awesome image. Uh, so just wanted to let everybody know. I had having... to, Bridger. I'm sorry. I just had to. <laughs> no, it's great. We have got, we've got a little contest going on now for who can make the best demotivational uh, caption for it. So I've got a link to that in the show notes if you're watching this afterwards. Check it out. It's on the Team Legacy forums. Um, it's, <laughs> it looks really funny. <laughs> it's, it's great. There's a lot of great examples in there, actually. Let me pull this up because in case I you I love have... how he's taking, like, 1,000 damage in this show. <laughs> <laughs> His dodge Perfect. bar is full. He's I like the obvious damage. arena net uh, thing in the uh, top corner there. Ugly troll is entering combat. Like, <laughs> derp, derp, <yeah. laughs> There's so much that can be done with that troll, though, too. So good. Oh, man. Oh, wait, I think we just crashed the forums. Fatal error out of memory. Whoa. <laughs> oh, uh, that's back back up. Up. There we go. They're back up. I had a they're problem for up. a while. Your forums are not tweet-proof. Uh-oh. I guess not. So there's a bunch of really interesting options in here. Let me see if we can find it. I'd like, some of the better ones were towards the bottom here. Uh, let's see. Where did I put my dodge skill? Real men don't dodge. In Soviet Russia, games dodge you. This is my favorite one. <laughs> dodge. As easy as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, F1, F2, F3, F4, and B. I wonder if, that, if it's implying that you have to hit all those buttons simultaneously in order to dodge. I like the Oprah one. Oh, the over you one get is dodged. great. And you get dodged. Everything gets dodged. <laughs> Fantastic. Watch your skills back. Talk to Freelancer. You took them away. <laughs> you don't get your skills back until you learn how to dodge. Oh, man. So anyway, come up with your own caption. There's a com fun little contest there. It's just for fun, really. We'll we'll declare a winner, I guess. and, uh, and or, or just, you know, enjoy the laughs that we get out of it. It's a creative, fun thing. So let's move on to... Another topic that's near and dear to my heart, because uh, Eric Flam said a lot of things over the weekend in the uh, Guild Wars 2 Guru forums. He was commenting about that TV underwater video. And you know, some of the things that people were asking him about are making me angry. And when I get angry and upset, I got a rant. And when I do, it's called a bridge of rant. Let's talk about it, ladies and gentlemen. Here we go. There were tons of people that kept asking about the Trinity. They had to know. They're like, wait a minute. What about the Holy Trinity, Eric? Isn't our players just going to say, okay, warrior, you're going to be the tank. And look, elementalist, you're going to spec healing rain. Because all these traits have been revealed. And so people say, well, clearly, I can spec all these characters out just like the regular Holy Trinity. What's stopping us from playing the Holy Trinity? Isn't that going to be the best? No! Oh, man, how many times do they have to say it? 
I guess I'll spell it out for you. Here's how it works, all right? Holy Trinity broken for a number of reasons. A, no targeted heals, no really, really high level heals. That's one important thing. But the other important thing that people don't really understand, because they do the math and they pretend like they can figure it out based on screenshots that we don't even know are accurate, that, well, if you uh, calculate the compassion plus this and then you get this and we've got healing rain, it does enough healing to, to heal him while he's getting hit. No, we don't know that for sure. It's just not possible to know that yet. We don't have the hard details. We don't have the formulas. But anyway, that's beside the fact. Even if you could have a healer that can do tons of healing, even if you could have that, the fact that there's no aggro management means that the quote-unquote tank isn't going to be able to hold aggro. It doesn't matter how much you heal that tank. He's not going to be able to hold aggro. It's going to chase after the healer. It's going to chase after somebody else. In fact, if anybody's played Guild Wars 1, and I believe this was the case as I've read it in a number of different places, you could play Guild Wars 1 and the tank and, and the enemy AI was smart enough to go, hey, that guy's got really ha high armor and he's got a lot of health left. That guy over there has low armor and he's almost dead. I'm gonna go kill him. The AI would actually respond dynamically to what was going on around it. If it sees somebody with high health and high armor, it realizes it can't do damage to that guy and goes after somebody else. You can't hold on to aggro. It's going to go with the proximity and the amount of damage that it can do and the amount of damage that you're doing it, and, and it's gonna take all that into account. So if you don't have aggro management, how are you going to have the traditional tank healer? And that means everybody's going to have to be responsible. If the bad troll comes after you, you have to be able to dodge. And that brings us back to Gow to the dodge thing. All right, you have to be able to tank by avoid avoiding damage. You have to be able to get out of the way and don't do damage for long enough for somebody else to pick it up for a little while. And then once they pick it up, then you can go back to doing damage until it gets back on you again. It's very dynamic. You have to try and move in the... And Eric Flannis Post perfectly explained this about how sometimes Izzy was going to be responsible for distracting it, sometimes he was responsible for putting conditions off of the friends and putting conditions on allies. It's really just not going to happen, guys. It's really just not. And I don't want to start a whole thing here because everybody's been talking about the Holy Trinity again since the traits thing, but it really doesn't look to me like the traits are going to... Specking into a specific role is going to make as big of a deal as it did in World of Warcraft or any of the past, you know, MMOs. <laughs> Bridger, have well, you taken your uh, blood pressure medication? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm all relaxed now. Deep I got breaths. it out of my Deep system. Breaths. Deep breaths. That's how it works. When, when, when people ask me about the Holy Trinity, I describe it like a three-legged stool. And if you take out one of the legs, the Trinity falls apart. Guild yep. Wars 2 doesn't have dedicated healing. There's your one, there goes one leg, therefore there is no Trinity. Oh, but also no aggro management. And there goes yeah. another leg. So not only did they take out one, even if you can make the argument that, well, I'll just use these AoE heals and pretend, then you still don't have aggro management. Yeah. Yep. Okay, Monster's getting kicked out of the channel here. <laughs> says, Are you going to spank uh. Spectacular? So, let's talk about this, though, uh, because we, we, we kind of left off last week not having finished our discussion on Build Wars 2. There's a lot of different things that you can talk about when it comes to the trade systems, but uh, there was a big kerfuffle, and I like using that word, so we need to have more of those things. Uh, we, there was a big kerfuffle <laughs> about the, and it's kerfuffle, see, it's a lower level than a scandal, I think. It's, it's, kerfuffle is when it's not really justifiable, I think. That's, that's my, that's my. Can you spell this, can you spell kerfuffle? Hang on, I'll get a dictionary down. <laughs> so, there's a kerfuffle specifically about the fact that you had to go back to a trainer in order to respec for PvE. Uh, so, Giga, what are your thoughts on that? Is that a big issue? Is that a, what, is that something that's going to break the emergency? I mean, what's what's going on here? I think it's kind of silly um, that people are upset about that because that's. But the thing is, Guild Wars Two is already raising their expectations. That's what they've had to do in every other game since. And they're like, "Well, while I'm out exploring the free world, doing whatever I want to do. You know, I can do World v. World. I can do PvP. I can do PVE. I can, you know, do anything. But oh, now I can't change on the fly. And I think they're kind of. Mm, tweaked about that, but it's a little unfounded. I mean, I don't think it's going to be a big deal that you can't change. It'd be nice if you could, but I, it's a gold sink. Yeah. They so, need it in the game. Vega, do you think that this is a reaction to all of the conveniences that ArenaNet has put into the game, like fast travel, like a lot of different things, like the speeding up on the crafting that we've seen, that sort of show that, hey, we're not trying to prolong the experience artificially. Exactly. And now I, they see this and they're reacting that this looks like one of those things. 
Um, I guess I yeah I could I could see that. Um, but I mean at the same time that you know they said from the beginning that who wants to sit there and watch you know while they're crafting something and watch the little bar go and sit there for like five minutes watching this bar go while you're crafting something you know. So it's it, you know they're trying to get rid of the pointless things that prolong the game. Like I, I for one like the fast travel because I I hated that in other MMOs if I wanted to travel somewhere. I got to sit there, and yeah, the sights are beautiful, but after, like, the 20th time, it gets boring. I just want to get there, you know? I'm not, I can't do anything on there while I'm traveling. Um, so I, I, for one, like the little things that try and, I guess, streamline the game. But um, I don't... I think it's... I, I like being able to have to go back to the trainer to do that because... Um, I just think it's if you're able to change everything on the fly in battle, it just I don't know, I think that's a little too much. Well when when you say you in don't battle get personalization. You, mean, you mean outside of combat, but still just out in the world whenever you want, basically. Oh hey, I'm going against a troll now, I'm gonna change my spec. Yeah, I I think I don't think it's I like having to go to a trainer to change my traits. You already have enough custom customization with your weapon sets and your your utility skills and stuff like that. Um, that's just my take on it. Yeah, you lose all the customization if you take that out. Like it's not your character that spec your way because you just change it. You know, every five minutes, like you you get no sense of identity there. That's what I was just gonna ask. So freelancer, that's that's sort of their one of their major points is this is supposed to be one of those things. I mean, people want their choices to mean something over the long term. I spec this way because I think it's the best way to have a character. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, frankly, I don't think it matters either way. This is a bunch of people being <laughs> crybabies. And this is like another one of those things, Bridger, we had like in our first two episodes where the forums guru, all these different communities, and there's even people in Team Legacy and some other sites that are doing it as well, where they have these discussions because we don't have beta in front of us. We can't play the game. So let's pick, let's pick at something because we have nothing better to argue. When these people get into game, it's not going to matter whether you have to run and respec or whether you can respec out in the field. They're not going to care. That's going to be 1% of their problems. Um, I think this is all trivial. It, it's not about immersion. It's not about any of that. I mean, I do, like we talked about last episode, I do, I am 100% against being able to change specs while in a competitive environment. But uh, it's uh, it's not really that big of a deal outside, especially in PvE or something casual like World v. World. Okay. So in World v. World, uh, I think we, we're, we're pretty sure that World v. World probably has the same sort of trait rules, as, you could, as, as, as I would imagine, as if you were in a PvE environment, i.e. you can change major traits, you can change utilities, you can change gear and stuff. All, all of that can be changed outside of actual combat, but you probably can't change your trait lines. Theoretically, there's a trainer in, like, the main base where you come portal into World v. World where you can go back and change your traits, theoretically. Uh, so to me, I mean, that seems okay to me. Uh, do you guys think in World v. World there should be different rules than in PvE as far as trait changing? Well, you know, Giga was right in one thing. Um, you know, I, I kind of nodded my head to it. Is if you allow traits to be changed in World v. World or just just out in the open period, you lose your your sense of work that you created by creating your own class. You know, your own setup. You know, uh, Bridger. Uh, if I want to build tanky <laughs> and I want to be, you know, my spec is going to be all tanky because that's how I want to play. And then I go out and somebody sees me, you know, doing something effectively and they just immediately copy what I'm doing. Then that just takes away so much of the sense of, you know, that I work to set up my own build that works for me. Mm -hmm. If everybody can just copy the guy next to him. And you know there's going to be those kids out there that can't do anything for themselves. And a system that allows them to just basically cheat off of another player and not learn any of the mechanics themselves is a system that just is going to be a detriment to the whole game entirely. Yeah, I mean, and I, I also certainly understand the concept of, I mean... Of course, MMORPGs come from tabletop RPGs, right? They, they come from the idea of, I'm making a character, and when you, this character gets stronger, you kind of make choices. Are you going to make this character physically stronger? Are they going to be more dexterous? Are they going to be whatever? Are they going to be able to use a rope better? Are they going to be able to use, uh, you know, deception and, you know, 
diplomacy, whatever. So these kinds of things are sort of how you build a character that has strengths and weaknesses, and that's what the trait system is. And a lot of people point out if you've got a character that can just switch back and forth between their strengths and weaknesses, there's no identity there. There's no character there. So from a PvE perspective, forcing people to have just a small two-minute problem. I mean, that's the other thing. They've got fast travel. It can't take longer than two minutes to go and port and change your skills and come back. But just that little thing makes your specific experience more permanent. It makes it more like, this is the character that I made and I probably shouldn't change it all the time. Yeah, it's just, you know, th think about, put it in this perspective, Bridger, or if you are trying to encourage the community to learn their class, okay, and they have all these skills associated with them and they have to test out these skills, you know, much like how you only get certain skills unlocked as you level up, you know, and um, especially your extra skills. Where where is the encouragement for a newer player? Because because not everybody's going to be a, a PvP -er and innately have that experience. Where is the encouragement? The the sense of uh, accomplishment. If I don't have to learn my class, I can just go out and copy somebody else. You know where where's where's the learning capability in that when somebody can just go out and do that? And that's what people are going to do if you make it where they can change on the fly while they're out in the open. By giving them, by forcing them to go back to town and experiencing that failure of a bad build, which obviously we all hope there's no such thing as a bad build, but having them experience that, that lack of efficiency forces them to go back and reevaluate the way they built their class. And therefore, through that process, they'll learn their class. And I just think having any respecking outside of you know a dedicated town encourages those other players that don't want to learn, that don't want to take that time to read guides and listen to advice and stuff, they don't have to at that point if you I, do that. I think it's actually going to help those players too because the players that don't, uh, they're, they're at least going to be forced into, because there's going to be players out there that are going to want to try all the things. Something, you know, they're going to die and they're going to blame it on their trait setup. They're going to blame it on their weapons. They're going to blame it on their utilities and say, oh, well, it wasn't my fault. I probably have the wrong thing. And they're going to go to another guide, and they're going to go to another guide. And the problem that they're having is probably that they're not sticking with any one single build long enough to really learn how to use it effectively. So this helps them, people who don't you know, know exactly what they're doing, to stick with something for a longer period of time and maybe get better at that one particular thing that they're, that they're trying to do so that they can figure out, oh, maybe if I spend some time with this, I can learn how to do it better. So that's probably you know, sort of a built-in uh, safety net for, for you know, I, keeping the skill, ceiling high, the skill floor I, high. I, I still think, though, that no matter what, there's always going to be those players that go to the forum, someone's going to post a build, and say, oh, this is a great, this is a great build, and they're just going to take it and they're going to run with it and they're going to copy it. So yeah, 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 yeah they, they have to go back to town to in, implement that build, but just because if they try something out and they have to go back to town and respec, I don't think that that's going to be the turning point to say, oh, I really need to work at this and get it done. There's still going to be players that when that happens, they're just going to alt tab out go to a forum, find out what the best build is or what the best build is right now, and just do that. So I think that no matter what, no matter what system you implement, there's always going to be players that look for the shortcut to the best build. Yep, and, and it sounds like uh, Freelancer and Vega, you guys are against the proposed right-click on target ally and copy their build exactly, right? That's that's not a feature that you would can, support. Can you imagine? <laughs> I'm just picturing, I'm picturing the horror stories of like that mechanic going to other games like Counter Strike or, or you know where I I've worked and worked and I and I decide that I'm going to buy this M16 and then I see this guy with an AWP and I just switch out my weapon to an AWP. <laughs> I mean, I'm just I'm picturing other games with the mechanic where you can change your your build out on the fly. And it's just, just I don't a... see any game where it would work. <laughs> just watch a scout instantly turn into a sniper in the mid fight. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, right there. I mean, if you choose scout and you run out in TF2 and you get you know, you come across these pyros and stuff, you should not be able to switch to a heavy on the fly. <laughs> right with the, with the barrels right already spinning up. Uh, yeah, After no. making a shotgun shot, you fire the first shot. Although that, that would make a really fun, like, just crazy mod to try out if you could just have the numpad and just have people switching instantly whenever they wanted to. That would just be a crazy fun mod. Or, or think about uh, Tribes Ascend where you're chasing somebody with, uh, what is the fastest one? I forget the name. Uh, the one that... Uh, Pathfinder, thank you. Uh, and, you know, as soon as you catch up to the guy, you switch up to a juggernaut. You know? <laughs> Mortar in your face from two feet. 
<laughs> anyway, Skilled Wars 2 podcast, Bridger. Let's go. <laughs> I didn't take it off topic. What? 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 All right. You so, took it off topic, Freelancer. <laughs> you're out of order. All right. So that's going to be very interesting. So uh, any any further thoughts? I mean, we kind of we had a long show last week about traits, but any further sh- thoughts that you guys have on the trait system in general? Uh, I'm I've I've become more and more enamored with it. Enamored? Enamored. There we go. Enamored with it. I've got armor on it, uh, like holding it to me or something. Um, so I, I really like the flexibility that it provides, but also the fact that each class has their own sort of slightly different take on it. Like they're not all identical. Let me ask this, actually. Now, that, what do you? How would you guys compare this to the talent system in terms of specking? Imagine if Guild Wars Two had a talent system, but it was done, you know, Guild War Two style. Right? Not exactly the same way as WoW, but you know, sort of a mastery unlock system to get the traits instead of the trait system that we have now. What, do you, what are your thoughts on that, Vega? So, the talent system, you mean like the, the talent tree system? Yeah, using a, either a talent tree or a League of Legends mastery system see, I, to provide see, the I same kinds of I bonuses. I don't like that system because it, it automatically constricts you. Mm-hmm. You know? Um, I feel that what Guild Wars is doing, it gives you more flexibility. And that with the whole skill tree system, um, you know, I mean, I guess they're similar, but I think that the Guild Wars one, you're more flexible and you're not locked into, um, I guess, getting certain skills that you may not need. You know, like you put the points into the tree, you get whatever traits you want, um, but that gives you more flexibility than just getting those other little... Because I, I don't know, I just feel like in WoW and in... And in, and in League of Legends, there's always the one tree that you're supposed to make if you're going to be a support or you're going to be a tank or you're going to be a DPS. There's always the one best tree. And I feel like that's not going to be the case with, with uh, Guild Wars because they have so much flexibility. It's because it's, a later, it's multiple trait, uh, trait lines and each one is lateral progression. It's not like there's a certain amount of... Uh, tiers of traits. Like if you put in 15 points, you get this one. And if you put in, you know, yeah, and, I mean, 10, you know, you got the So it's not three, a power progression the further you go in. Master, basically. Grandmaster. Exactly. And it's not, it doesn't limit your choices at any tier. You can pick, you can slot the same trait that you were going to put in your final slot in your second slot. It doesn't lock you in in any way. So you get to have multiple tracks, like seven different trait lines. And each one has a huge amount of lateral progression at each um, point when you get to into that every 10 points. So yeah. it gives you so many more options instead of being like, you have to go down this or down this. Like, I mean, it's especially, not com- especially comparing it to like League of Legends. So League of Legends, every single character gets the same, you know, trees. But mm-hmm. in Guild Wars, every single character has their own unique trait tree. You know, so yeah, it's like it's like wow in that sense. But wow, you had what? You had three different trees. Yeah. And mm-hmm. in Guild Wars, you have what five? That's just the fact that you've got five lines instead of three, and that each line is a little bit shorter. So that whereas you know what was it? Um, I don't remember what the various, but you know originally when World of Warcraft came out, it was the thirty-one like twenty-one build or something like that, right? You could only you could only max out one build. And they only have enough talents, uh, talent points left over to go partway down another uh, tree. So you would always, always spec in one specific thing. The default in Guild Wars is that you can always, obviously at max level, you can always spec in at least two things. And that is just goes to, to continue on the thing of, hey, your character is not a single role. Your character is multi-role. And that's why you choose two things to be really good at. And then another thing that you can be partially good at. Or you can choose, you know, three things to be pretty good at and another thing to be a little good at. It's just, it just allows so much flexibility. And I really hope that it, all the flexibility that appears to be there is there in the actual yeah. game. Uh, Freelancer, your thoughts, uh, the talent tree system versus this, this system. Imagine if we had five talent trees. Uh, is it still better to have this system? I, I'm a big proponent. If it's not broken, don't fix it. I mean, Guild Wars 2 is improving on a lot of things. We all know that. But I don't think there is anything truly wrong with the, the trait tree system at all. I mean, I, I enjoyed it. it it's going to take a 
uh, analytical mind some to understand that you don't have to go down certain routes you can put a little few points here put a few little you know you know it, the, that tree is even with the three trees even like in league you can deviate to create your own class you know i may know that like in league i play a lot of glass cannon type builds i know that even though it recommends me the solo mid guys recommend me to grab plus six armor that I'm not going to get poked as much as another player would, so I'm going. I may take a little bit more attack speed or a little bit more life steal. I mean, I don't think they were broken. I mean, what, League took it from WoW. I, I truly don't think anybody really complained about it in WoW. And uh, Guild Wars 2 is doing it differently. They're not doing it wrong, so I don't think it's going to really be an improvement or, or a lack of improvement. I just think it's different. I didn't think the trait the trait tree system was was all that bad. It definitely. I mean, the way that WoW did it eventually is is it allowed a decent amount of flexibility within each spec, right? I mean, you could you could say uh, like I was a shaman, so you could do an enhancement shaman, and you could choose to be you know sort of go down this side of it or that side of it, uh, and then at the end though everybody always got that single one big super awesome skill at the end. You know, for a while it was like the storm strike, and then they changed it up so storm strike was earlier, whatever. Um, but you know, that's that's the that's the whole thing is that the the tr the talent trees are all really about going down this one line to get that big thing at the end. And the way that and, and like like you said, it's different with the way that ArenaNet is doing the trade system. And as uh, Giga pointed out, quite right, or maybe vague. I'm sorry. Um, their lateral progression, and not only that, but there's no power progression. The major trait that you slot in at the 10-point mark isn't any po more powerful than the one at the 30-point mark. You get the same choices all the way along. I, I kind of see how that goes with ArenaNet's philosophy, I guess, for this game in that there is no Holy Trinity. You don't have to spec specifically into this thing in order to get lots of power. You can spec a little bit into a tree and still get something really good out of it and not have to go really deep in order to get the super awesome Storm Strike ability or what have you. So, I, I think I definitely prefer the way that ArenaNet's doing it, but I don't know, you could make a talent system with ArenaNet's philosophy and maybe make the talent system better. But see, even in, even in WoW, I mean, the skills that you got at the first couple of tiers of the, of the trait tree were just as powerful as the final skills. They actually did change it over time, didn't it, they? It, well, even in the beginning, like I mean, even horrible. in the beginning, I, everybody knows I played a, a rogue. My gouge plus 1.5 second stun time was by far the most important three points that I put into my entire trait tree. Because that, that gouge, 1.5 second extra stun time, meant the difference between all of my 1v1 matchups when I'd use it three or four times to kill you. And, you know, of course you can go down the tree and you got all these other things, but to say that ArenaNet is making it where all the skills are evenly balanced, I don't think, you know, WoW or League of Legends really made it, you know, did that any differently in that respect. WoW's um, Cataclysm revamp, they totally made, like, took away all your choices. They made you have to go all the way down one tree before you could even get into another one. And That's they right, gave they you did. I forgot about that. Almost all of your that. abilities, like, when you just pick a tree. Like, so they took, like, all the choice out of it. Anyway, like, it, I don't think it's a good analogy even to, to League of Legends now because it's gone completely the other way. And with the uh, Panda expansion <laughs> getting even more so, going along the lines of their D3 skill system, what they just revamped, it's, again, limits your choices. I don't know if you've seen it, but the new D3 skill system is you get, like, one defensive skill and you get to pick between, like, three or four. And, that's, and then you get have to have a spammy skill and a big nuke skill and an AOE. You can't even, like, spec out the different types of skills that you want. Really? You get one of each type, yeah. I'm that's guessing a, that makes it easier to balance really them each because it. if you know that you're only balancing the choice of this, you know, AOE skill against these other AOE skills, then it's easier to it's deal with. It's a competitive with. game, though. <laughs> like, they already said yeah, they've, specifically they're they've, they've not restricted it a lot. Like... It doesn't make any sense to me. Lateral progression is always, always, always 100% better because it gives you more choices. It gives you a higher skill cap in creating your builds. And 
it, it allows for more viable choices. So, you know, why can't we just go back to the skill book system from Diablo 1? <laughs> <laughs> why do we have to get all complicated with this? Why can't we just all collect books and read them if we need the skill? Well, that's how it used to be in World of Warcraft. Remember that? You couldn't yeah. get your first aid, you know, two, 200 until I'm you I'm talking went about it way back book. in Diablo 1. If I, if I were a warrior and I wanted Fireball, God damn it, I'll go read a Fireball book. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that was the end of it, you know? The select a class. Well, that's, that's what uh, you like. Liked about that? Uh, what's that new Diablo clone uh, that just uh, uh, Path of Exile? Path yeah. of Exile. That's what you liked about like about that. I do like that. I mean, and you're talking about a trait tree. That's a trait forest. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and, yeah, and you could spec any way you want. I mean, you're not limited to the skills and abilities of one class because every class gets access to all skills in the game. Um, in the way you you know give yourself attributes, intelligence, dexterity, as you can imagine. Um, you get, you, any class can do that, and you can kind of create your own class. And the way they differentiated the classes in that game, and I'm not saying it's better than Guild Wars. I think I like the way Guild Wars is doing it better. But the way in Path of Exile they're differentiating the classes are they start you in different parts of the trees, much like Final Fantasy X. Uh, Mm-hmm. If any of you guys played out that out there, I mean, all the classes can get access to everything eventually, but the classes are different because they start at separate areas on there. Interesting. Uh, that's actually one of the reasons that I really liked the sort of class upgrade and skill system in Kingdoms of Amalur because I loved the sort of customize your class where it's not, okay, you're a warrior so you only have access to these things because you chose warrior. You have access to any of the things and it's based on the things that you choose to get that determines your class. Instead of your class limiting you, it's the choices that you make determining your class and that's sort of what Skyrim was kind of going for with a you know, choose which you know upgrades you want to get based on what you're doing. They didn't have a, a built-in class system in there either so it definitely gives people really like that flexibility i think um and i'm looking forward to seeing and i really really hope that like 30 30 10 splits can be just as effective as some other that's like uh 30 20 20 or you know 20 20 20 10 uh, splits i'm hoping that those kinds of splits can be as effective as the super spec 30 30 10 kind of a thing and super role selected so We'll, we'll have to see. Again, that's, that's I, I will be... prove to you it is, Bridger. I, you better, because I want that to be true. <laughs> I'd love to have tons of options to just play around with. That would just really... Wouldn't that just increase the replayability for forever? Yeah, I think so. I mean, because if you look at the spec trees uh, in Guild Wars 2, some of those... Uh, and I wrote an article on this, um, but some of those final, you know, down the... Tr- if you go 30 into a, a particular mm-hmm. trait, they're just not all that appealing and maybe to certain players but i was looking at the mesmer you know back when i messed up my math and said i had 90 points but, <laughs> but what uh what i was honestly talking about then was that the build i was looking at for the mesmer there was only actually one tree one one uh, of those five uh i guess what do they call it tree lines uh, or trait lines, trait yeah. lines yeah. um that actually appealed to me so my build ended up being a, a split of like 15 points here 20 points here and uh and that's that's fully what I intend on going with. I mean, this it's obviously going to change a little bit before launch, but I have my dream build now, and it only actually has one uh, trait line with 30 points. So I think a lot of players, when they look at it in that respect and they see, do I really can I really use a skill? Like the Mesmer has one of the near the end, where every time you dodge, you create a uh, I think it was a phantasm, right? Oh, cool. Um, I like that. So uh, clone. Actually. Is it a clone? Well, it's it's a clone, yeah. Either way, when you dodge, you uh, you create a decoy, and you know that seems like a really powerful skill. Well, in that trait line, that particular skill is the only one that's actually appealing in the least bit, and uh, you know, and that was like I think two of those little diamond thing uh, diamond things into it. So thirty point or what is that? Fifteen, ten, twenty points, something like that. So, but at that point, there's no reason to go further than that. And there was a couple other skills in there as well. And I think a lot of players, when they actually break it down they're going to see that i don't really need 30 points in here i don't really need 30 points in here because if you go 30 points into a trait line all you're getting from it is what extra power or extra uh, you know health or whatever it might be and that's just quickly offset by your gear so you have to quite literally look at it from the skill like do i need that skill you know and if i don't I, then there's no reason to go into it i hope that there are builds that are 30 that have the max level because i feel like I'm sure I there right, will be. Right now, I'm right now it, is in, it is impossible for us to look at every single possible combination um, 
that you could do and say whether or not it's going to be viable. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. Until we actually get our hands on the game and can play it and test stuff out. Yeah, all the numbers look great, but how well does it translate into an actual battle? Um, and yeah, it's all about the skills and it's all about the major traits and stuff like that. But that's the thing is that I hope yeah. that there are builds that are, if you go 30-30-10, that you're just not more of a specialized, you're very focused on one thing as opposed to someone who's more of a jack-of-all-trades and going like the 15-15-20, whatever. Um, so I, that's, that, I just really hope that there is no, oh, well, that's just a stupid build. Don't do that. I hope that there's always a way to make a build work. Obviously, builds, every build's going to have a weakness, and every build's going to have a, you know, a strength. And I hope that people can try and figure them out and have fun with it. Well, that's the cool thing, isn't it? The, in MMOs up until this point, specialized builds were like king. And if, it, if you were a jack of all trades, that was never viable. And now exactly. it's going to be like one. It's going to be both. I don't think it's going to be one way or the other. I think it's going to be both can live together and both be viable choices. And what more could you want, right? <laughs> well, specifically exactly. because their gear system is going to support the jack of all trades thing. Because if you recall from that, and I think this is still true. I haven't heard anything different. But from that original traits and at or, or the original attributes article from the uh, from the Arena Net blog, when they were talking about how uh, if if you get uh, something like you know, plus 200 power, a single stat from a piece of gear, uh, on a piece of gear. Like if your chest gives you plus 200 power at max level, just making up number. But if you instead get one that gives you power and vitality, it'll give you like plus 130 for, of each. So the total you get from having multiple stats is greater than if you try to get a single stat maxed out, which sort of helps support the jack of all trades a little bit because it's obvious that if you, you know, in all games have done this, if you stack into one specific role or, or uh, attribute or what have you, that you can make it really kind of broken within the system. And that's why people always do that instead of trying to spread their, <laughs> their stuff out. So, It's a good anyway. use of stat budget. I like it. I like it. Yes. So, so I'm hoping that that gear system is still in place where, you know, the more traits or, or <laughs> attributes rather that are on something the more uh the more total you get out of everything so anyway i think we've uh, beat that topic into the ground any final thoughts from anybody no uh you went too easy on them a couple week a week or so ago uh freelancer about saying that they could, maybe you should be able to change stuff in pvp not at all no, not even utility skills i think you should be locked in 100 percent because it's mm. I, it's a competitive I, they, they, environment. Oh no! Here comes more hate mail. <laughs> well, there's there's an there's an argument that I had that was not uh, that I didn't get to voice last week that I just thought of recently, and that's um, based on the concept of Yomi and trying to predict what your opponent's about to do. Right? I mean, that's a very David Serlin fighting game concept for a lot of people that read that stuff. They know exactly what I'm talking about. But it's trying to you know some people who play poker, for example, can tell when the other guy's bluffing. Sometimes when you're playing a fighting game, you can watch the other person and learn and try to predict what their next move is going to be. That's the idea of Yomi, reading the mm -hmm. opponent's mind, reading their moves, trying to figure out what they're going to do next. That's a big sort of head games that are being played within the game. It's like a meta game within the game. Now, when it comes to utility skills, at the beginning of a match, that Yomi will be there because you have no idea what utility skills that Elementalist is bringing to the table. Does he have something that's going to allow him to crit three times in a row? Because there are quite a few awesome Elementalist things that basically say your next shot is a crit automatically, and then it's on a big cooldown. Um, so is he going to be able to crit and do some unexpected spike damage? Is he going to be able to, you know, stun you an extra time? Is he going to be able to do this? Is he going to be able to do that? So... There's a bit of a guessing game in what he's about to do next. There are a lot of things you do know. You know exactly what weapon he has, so you know a lot of the things that he is going to be capable of. But you don't know this specific things about the utility in the elites. So later on in the match, if you've been, for example, fighting over a point with one of their other guys, and you know that that elementalist, he's used these specific utility skills on you, that mystery, that, that, mis that, that lack of information is no longer there. Now you're working with more complete information. You know exactly what his build is. You know exactly what it's capable of. And it takes away any unexpected, you know, holy crap moments. Like, wow, I can't believe he predicted that so well. Or he got in that guy's head and he knew exactly what was going to come. So it, it takes away some of that. I'm not going to say it takes away all of that. So that's, that's another reason that I think the utilities being swappable is uh, really very useful in a PvP environment. Because it keeps that 
lack of information and allows people to make those judgment calls and try to predict exactly what their opponent's going to do. Well, I think he's going to do this, so I'm going to switch out my utilities to try and prepare for that. I mean, that's the kind of thing. If you expect a Zergling attack, you, pre you, know, you prepare and, and you know, build a, a bunker or what have you. So it's, it's Then your those build doesn't have to be things. as good, though, because you can just change it on the fly. <laughs> like, that's, that's what I think. It's not I on think the you fly, lose though. In, in combat, you can't change it. You can't change it in combat. But you can say, here's the thing. You say, okay, here, I'm going against a thief. I'm going to take the abilities that let me auto-win that fight. I'm gonna, and then I'm going to engage him. And then I'm going to go to another it's point. It's an engineer. Though. I'm going to take the I abilities really... that let me auto-win that fight. And I'm going to be I, no, 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 no. You are way over-emphasizing the power of uh, utility skills. They're all on really large cooldowns. They don't let you auto-win fights. There's no such thing as I bring these utilities to counter your utilities. You're still going to be using those weapons the vast majority of the time. The uh, utilities are what they are. They're utilities. They are on much longer cooldowns than the weapon skills. They're not, they're not nearly as important as the weapon skills. And those are locked in. So I think you're overestimating that. But anyway, we talked about that a lot last week. I just wanted to bring, up, bring, bring to bear what I, one, one argument that I didn't use. Um, but I think at this point we'll just have to agree to disagree until uh, we get our hands on the game <laughs> and we can actually see what it's like uh, with regards to the PvP uh, slot changing whatever. <laughs> <laughs> all right uh we are just coming up to nearly about an hour here so i think this is probably a good length for the show we didn't have a lot of news this week i'm hoping we get another arena net post blog post or something like that to uh to talk about for next week's show any final thoughts you guys want to uh make on anything here arena net it's my birthday tomorrow send me beta that's <laughs> <laughs> my team i was wondering if that was coming <laughs> well uh ArenaNet. Uh... By, by the way, ArenaNet, apparently it's also the entire chat room's birthday. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's not my birthday, but I'll, I'll, I'll reply to every single piece of feedback that you need. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. What the, heck did the, what the heck do I have to offer that they could possibly want? Like, I have this, so you should give me access to get it. Like, I control, I control the audience uh, that I have, and they believe exactly what I believe, so tell me to give me beta, and I will... No, I don't think I have that power. You want people will boycott <laughs> the game and not buy it if you don't. Exactly. <laughs> oh, exactly. I will threaten. No. We will we'll get in when we get in. And by the way, the longer we have to wait, and I've said this to a lot of people who got, ah, I can't believe we're not in the game. The longer we have to wait, the better the version is going to be when we get it, right? And the closer to release, so the more accurate it's going to be. If we got in right now and we were theory crafting with all the stats, stats right now, they could be changing traits. They're still adding traits. I mean, getting in now won't do that much more than just satisfy some of your curiosity. It will, it will maybe even make it worse because you'll be remembering, you know, that time that you played the Elementalist, but now your main is a thief and... And you remember that the Elementalists had this, this, and this, and those things got changed. And now when you're playing against an Elementalist, you'll be just wrong because you, you haven't, you, you, you learned the wrong things when you were too early in the beta. So, yeah, it could be good. could be bad. We're, I still want to play it. <laughs> you'll have something that's OP, and then you'll be like, oh, crap, I missed that. <laughs> exactly, right? I, I was want, I want to back throw a little beta. plug, uh, Bridger, uh, on our segment we have coming up. Oh, yeah. That's okay. Our, Tell us absolutely. about that. Um, those of you guys who tuned in, uh, what was it, two or three episodes ago, we mentioned that we're going to be doing a PvP, uh, kind of like an esports reporting slash uh, balance discussion, all of the related ideas uh, segment called, uh, well, what do we ended up calling it, Bridger? Straight Talk with Tales of Tyria. <laughs> okay, that's what we got. So the idea, guys, is uh, we're getting a couple of big names on. Um, I've already gotten in contact with... Uh, well, some of you guys know him as Marcus. Some of you know him as DJ Wheat. We'll be trying to kick off our first segment with him. Uh, we're setting up times with him now. We are in contact, and uh, we're going to basically set up a sign-in sheet where we want to get a lot of you guys that are watching now as among uh, anybody that you have contacts with, et cetera, where we want to bring on a new face from the tournament scene, uh, talking GVG tournament scene. We're talking big-time uh, WoW you know, scene. Uh, we're talking serious uh, those who truly can say, I played in esports or I played in you know a competitive fashion. We want to bring them on. Me and Bridger are going to kind of pick their mind. We're going to have them talk. And uh, through this sign-up sheet, we're going to try to get a new face on every single week. And the idea of this segment, um, as you can imagine, is we want to break down uh, in straight talk. No fluff, no RP, no none of that. Uh, you know, what, 
what the issues are and more importantly what makes us excited and just the big topics that all of you guys are discussing out in the community such as guru and team legacy so there's no definitive date yet it's quite literally based on a couple people we're talking to uh, but when we get that kicked off, we would love for you guys, if you know people in the scene, um, to have them sign up for that. I'm thinking it's going to be a really big show. Mm -hmm. If any of you guys saw like State of the Game for StarCraft, uh, that kind of idea is what we're aiming for. We want to really create a quality uh, PvP-oriented podcast that you guys can really respect. So that's all I got, Bridger. All right. Yeah, we're definitely, you know, we're, we're kind of trying to make sure that when we launch that show, you know, we're going to start it as a segment on Tales of Tyria, but we want to make sure that we have enough to talk about with relates to Guild Wars 2. Because right now, we're, you know, we, we only have so much. I mean, we're missing so many traits and all this other stuff. We don't want to jump into this too soon to where we run out of, you know, PvP specific, you know, competitive minded things to talk about. But uh, we're going to be getting that uh, as soon as we do, we'll get started on. Not quite the, the, the Guild Wars 2 related, but competitive game general things about competitive yep. spirit and mindset and, and, you know, what it takes to, to play at a competitive level and things like that. We've talked about that. Competitive RPers. Yes, competitive RPers. I can do a better <laughs> British accent than you. <laughs> all, all jokes aside, even, even those of you out that are listening now that... Uh, that you you never have you know you never competed in that hardcore arena scene or you never GVG, but you have the uh, you know you have the drive to you know even just basically learn about it. Uh, we're we're not going to be like the elitist show that just talks down to you. Uh, I know when we get DJ Weed on, he has a lot of great words of advice that he wants to give to all you guys that uh, that want to enter something a little bit more serious than the average uh, casual PvP. -er. And uh, there's there's a lot of things that that everybody can learn, including myself and uh, everybody at Tales of Tyria. So it'll be not only a, a learning experience for all of us, but we'll break down all of the latest discussions. It'll be a good time. I yeah, hope you guys and, and that is that is one of the points of the show. It's not to be only for the elite because we're going to be using all this jargon that nobody's going to understand. We're going to try to break it down so that everybody can understand it. I mean, that's that's the whole point of the show. It's to make competitive PvP more accessible because that's in the end what we want. As competitive gamers, we want more people to join the scene. We want it to be as big as League of Legends, for example. I think that might be a little too big of an ambition, but nah, no, we want it we to got be. This. <laughs> World of Warcraft only this. had Guild... 10 million, and 8 million of those were Care Bears, but we can break the 34 million competitive gamer mark with Guild Wars 2. <laughs> you, can, you just wait and see. So, Guild uh... Wars 2 is going to crush League of Legends. Now, I don't know about StarCraft, but we'll see about that. <laughs> but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get League of Legends. All right, so yeah, we're, that's that's one of the things. Like I said, we're trying to make it accessible. This is for you to learn more about from these people that we're bringing onto the show. Uh, so they're going to be able to come on and say, "Here's what my elementalist build does, and here's why I built it this way," and and etc. That's yep. that's the kind of thing that we're going to get into is sort of the design of this build, the function of this build, and not just here's the build. It's good for killing things. <laughs> like that's we want to get deep into it and figure out so that you can help uh, help you guys understand and, uh, and help us understand what what's going through their heads when they put it together. And I find that stuff really mm -hmm. fascinating. So, all right, that's uh, a little preview of what we got coming up uh, in the near future. There, uh, let's see. Got a couple of quick show updates. Want to get, send a quick thanks to uh, Clayton, Darren, and Raymond for donating to the show last week. Help us out uh, if you feel like donating, but do not feel obligated, of course. And uh, we're also back to normal time next week and for everybody in Europe who may not have gotten the memo the US and this is something I found out after the end of last show otherwise I totally would have mentioned in the last show is that uh, we just shifted to daylight savings time this week so now I'm guessing there's some people from Europe tuning in right now going oh no the show's over I don't know why they would have a California weed yeah. smokers accent <laughs> yo dude <laughs> <laughs> that was completely wrong. But they might be tuning in right now because the U.S. shifted in daylight savings, but Europe doesn't shift for another week or two, uh, two weeks, I think. So sorry about that if you, got, uh, if you didn't get the memo on the times, time change. But we're back to 8 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time next week. And we're also going to, let's see, have a question of the week this week. Guys, what do you think the question of the week is? Uh, when is beta? <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Uh, we, we talked last week, we doesn't talked count. about the, you know, should you be able to change traits and stuff in PvP? Uh, let's, let's ask you this. Do you agree with Freelancer that the whole kerfuffle oh, no. 
over the <laughs> over the over the going back to the trainer is that just a smokescreen because people can't play the game would they be caring at all about it or is this a legitimate thing that like i shouldn't be wasting my time it's my time damn it and i'm not paying for anything so i don't know give us your thoughts Trust on me. what we're talking or, about. or you could stand Trust by me, me and prove bridger wrong and just be like does it really matter <laughs> Yeah, that's that's all you got to say. If, if this is trivial, Bridger, stop talking about things that don't matter. Let's My immersion! <laughs> um, <laughs> so you can send that to us on the Team Legacy forums. We're going to have a, a post about the show up there in just, uh, you know, 24 hours or so when I get it up tomorrow. And uh, I think that's it. No more updates. Oh, yes, follow us on Twitter, TalesOfTyria.com, uh, t- at TalesOfTyria, even. And uh, for those of you still watching the stream... We're going to be doing some Super Monday Night Combat on the stream here. I know we normally do League of Legends after the stream, but we're going to be shifting over to Super Monday Night Combat for this week because why not? I've been having a blast with it. we got a whole bunch of extra keys, so we're going to try to do a full in-house game with uh, anybody from the community and anybody from uh, Team Legacy that's on the, the Team Legacy uh, team speak, which I will grab the copy the link here for everybody in the chat so if you're not on the team speak jump on there and if you feel like playing super monday night combat or just watching us play super monday night combat that'll be on the stream here very shortly so i believe with that it is time to get out of here everybody thanks everybody for joining us this is the time to say goodbye i wish we had more to talk about but we'll see what happens next week stay tuned see you guys Take care.